So this video is going to add on to lab 12 talking about natural selection. So where we left off in the video that you watched was that in the first generation of the marble experiment, um, we were looking at deleterious alleles. And deleterious alleles are alleles that are um, lethal. And so in that experiment, the black marbles always represented the dominant and the white marbles was always the recessive. And so in the first round, the recessive allele was the one that was deleterious, meaning that was the one that died off. And so what that represents is that the two white marbles together would be the ones that would die off, right? Because you have to inherit two recessive alleles to have the recessive phenotype. So in round one, the recessive alleles were deleterious. Now what you saw in that video was that in round one, it in five generations that we looked at, the white marbles did not disappear from the population. And that's because if you have heterozygous individuals, right, heterozygous individuals will keep that recessive allele in the population. That trait will continue um, to still be in the population. And again, it's not likely that you're gonna ever get rid of that allele completely because as the frequency of that allele gets lower and lower and lower, the chance of two heterozygous individuals coming together and producing that recessive offspring to eliminate it from the gene pool is not very likely. And so that's why we see so many recessive diseases that um, can stay in the population because we can have instances where carriers will pass those traits on and therefore those traits um, can stay within the population. In round two of this experiment, the dominant allele is going to be the allele that is deleterious. This is the one that's gonna die off. So if the dominant allele is deleterious, which ones are gonna die off? Which marble pairs are gonna die off? Well, homozygous dominant is gonna die, right? So the black-black combination is gonna die because they have two dominant alleles, as well as the heterozygous. The black and the white together is also gonna die, right? Because having just one dominant allele is going to be deleterious. That phenotype is gonna be seen. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at when we draw our marbles, we want to look at and see how many generations does it take to remove the dominant allele from our population. And so let's look at that experiment. The previous video had no sound during this, so I'm going to go and voice over um, that so you can hear the sound that goes along with that. Okay, so he's starting with his population again, and he's shaking them up to make the process random, and he's gonna pull out marble pairs, and you're gonna record this in table 12-2. And so you're gonna have your cups, right? So these are gonna be your cups that you have, and you're gonna record the number of homozygous dominant. So we have homozygous recessive, there's one, recessive, heterozygous, recessive, recessive, hetero, hetero, homozygous dominant, hetero, 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 homo recessive, homozygous dominant, hetero, hetero, homozygous dominant, hetero, 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 homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, Heterozygous, heterozygous, 
homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive, heterozygous, heterozygous, homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, 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 homozygous recessive. And so now when you think about this, which of these are gonna die off? And the answer is, is that anything that has the dominant is gonna die. So look at your new population. The only thing that survives is homozygous recessive because if it has the dominant allele, it's not going to be able to survive. And therefore, it only takes one generation to remove that from the population. So what we saw in that experiment is that if you have a dominant deleterious allele, that would be lethal within one generation, right? Because if the dominant allele is the one that is lethal, even being heterozygous is going to die off. And the only thing that survived in round two was homozygous recessive. So it only took one generation for that dominant deleterious allele to be removed from our population. Whereas in the first round, when the recessive allele was the one that was deleterious, that one, right, after five rounds, we still had the recessive deleterious allele in the population because the heterozygous um, survived. Now, there is an exception to um, the dominant allele being removed in the first generation, and that is that in some cases, dominant deleterious alleles aren't necessarily lethal right away, meaning it doesn't mean that the babies can't be born. It could be a condition, a dominant allele can be um, a disease that comes on late onset. So an example of this would be a disease called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a neurological disease. It's a degenerative neurological disease. Huntington's typically comes on in many patients in their 40s or 50s. And so you have to think about it that if somebody can survive to their 40s or 50s, they've likely already passed on that dominant deleterious allele prior to getting the disease. So what that means is that they still have offspring and they pass that trait on to their offspring, but it's deleterious later in life. They still die early, but maybe not as early um, or not being born at all, right? And so in that case, if the deleterious dominant allele has a late onset, what that means is that that allele can stay in the population. And so that's why Huntington's disease continues to be seen because by the time people um, are diagnosed with the disease or even know that they have it, they've likely already had kids and those kids have passed on that trait. Another example would be achondroplasia. Achondroplasia is a type of dwarfism. If you've ever seen that show, Little, Little People, Big World, you've probably seen that you can have two parents who have dwarfism now, I'm not sure if they have the achondroplasia specifically, but you can see this example there. You have two parents who have dwarfism and they have normal height children. The reason for that is that achondroplasia is a dominant trait. So those two people who have dwarfism, they both carry the recessive allele. And by chance, they can both pass on those recessive alleles to their children and have normal height kids. Now, typically achondroplasia, people who are born with that, have a shorter lifespan than the general public, right, than most people. But again, not so deleterious that it, it, um, that it kills them before reproductive age. And so in that case, they can pass that trait on to their offspring and that dominant allele stays within the population. And so there are cases where a dominant deleterious allele can remain in a population for more than one generation. But again, it has to be something that comes on later in life 
um, and isn't deleterious until after reproductive ages. Because again, if they can reproduce, then they can still pass on that trait to their offspring. And so there are exceptions, but again, in this experiment, we were looking at that they would die right away. And so in that case, our dominant deleterious allele was wiped out of our population after one generation because none of them that had the dominant allele would survive and pass that trait on to the next generation. And so that's what we were looking at um, in that experiment. Now, the next thing that I wanna go over with you and spend a little bit of time on is talking about the graphs for the natural selection experiment for the predator-prey interactions. And so I just wanna kinda go over with you what does that graph look like so that you can have a general understanding of what this should look like. So, there we go. So this is the data table um, for your experiment. And so this is your table 12-3. And what you're looking at is the predator populations over time. And so when you do your graph, you're gonna have two axes right? You're going to have your population size, right? Your population size. And you're going to have, um, so your population size and by generation, meaning we're going to look at how the number of predators change over generations. So if you think about this, right, if we're thinking about a graph and our X and our Y, we want to think about which one is our dependent and which one is our independent. So does the number of predators, so the predator population, does it depend on the generation or does the generation depend on the number of predators? Well, the generation time can't change depending on the number of predators. So it's predators, the number of predators that depends on the generation. So your predators are gonna be your dependent variable those are gonna be on your y-axis, and you'll see this in a minute. And you're going to have your generation, which is like time, on your x-axis, because that is your independent. So what you're looking at is you wanna look and see what happens to these populations over time. So if I look at the forceps, right? In the first generation of the parental generation, we started with six forceps. After one generation, we still had six. In the third generation, we had six, and in the fourth, we had five. So our population decreased a little bit. In our pliers, it was six, seven, eight, and then 10. So the pliers were somewhat well adapted because their population was increasing over time. So what you wanna think about is what type of graph would best represent this? right? What type of graph should we do for this type of data? If we're measuring something over time and the data is continuous, what type of graph would we use? The answer is going to be a line graph, right? We want to look at these populations over time and therefore that would be continuous data and we should use a line graph. Now the next thing, how many lines are you going to have? Well, we looked at five different predator mouth parts. We looked at forceps, pliers, rulers, spoons, and chopsticks. So how many lines are you going to have on your graph? And the answer is you are going to have five lines, five lines. So we'll talk about that more in a minute. Now let's look at the prey table. So here is the prey table. So the prey table, let me move this up here for a second. Here is our prey table, right? And so what we're looking at is the prey population over size, over time. So when you're graphing this part, it's, it's a little bit confusing when you look at this to know which part you should be graphing. Again, we're looking at the prey population over time. So when you're graphing it, you're gonna graph these initial numbers. So when we start, the green was at 150. In the second generation, we're gonna plot 
278. In the third generation, you're going to plot 510. And in the fourth generation, you're going to plot 944. So when you're looking at this table, I know it looks really busy and it's hard to figure out what to graph but you're gonna graph the initial numbers each time. So your parental generation, your second generation, you see the initial numbers, then the third generation, your initials, and the fourth. Because you'll notice, again, if you look and you compare, if you look and you compare, depending on the number of survivors, right, each of those survivors that survived, they reproduced, and that gave us the next and initial number. So in the first generation, right, the number of survivors for the green beans, um, there were 139. So if each of those represented or um, reproduced, the next population size would be 278. So in the second generation, there would be 278 individuals. And then in the third generation, there would be 510. And in the fourth generation, there would be 944. So those are the numbers that you want to graph. You want to graph in this table the initial numbers every time. You don't want to graph all the rest of it. So it's just the initial numbers that are going to be graphed. So here are our graphs that we're going to look at. So again, actually I'll put this up top. There we go. So again, we're going to have two graphs for this. We're gonna have one that's looking at the predator population, and we're going to have one that's looking at the prey population size. So I gave you some terms that you might want to include in your title. So predator, right? So if you're talking about the predator population, so predator, you wanna have mouth part, right? Because you're looking at the effect of various mouth parts, and you should have natural selection in your title. In your second graph, the terms that you want to include, you want to include prey, right? Because you were looking at the prey population. You want to include the term beans because we were looking at the different color beans. And then again, you want to include the term natural selection. So make sure to incorporate those terms into your title in some way. So let's start with the predator um, population. So again, we said that the number of predators, so our predator population size, depends on the generation. And so our predator population size is going to go on our Y, and our X is going to be, let's get this to pop up, and the X is going to be the generations. And so that's what we have here. We have our uh, Y axis has our predator population size, and our x-axis has our generation. Now, if you look at your table, right, if you look at that table, you need to look at what is the largest number that you had for your predator population size. And the largest number that you had in your table was 14. So when you make your scale, you wanna make sure to make it so that it can fit on the paper. You want it to take up most of the paper. You don't want it to just occupy one little corner most of your graphing paper, um, and so use your scale accordingly. And so what I did was I put on the Y, or the X axis, we have the parental generation, we have the second, third, and the fourth, and then my scale for my predator population on my graph paper would be three, six, nine, 12, and 15, because again, 14 is my highest number. So I would set my graph up like this. Now again, we said that this needs to be a line graph, right? And how many lines are we going to have? Remember, we're gonna have five lines. So if I were to take and look at the first data, so what I had was for my first mouth part, the numbers were six, 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 and five. And so those are my data points. And so I would put my data points on and then connect my dots. Now you can do this with different colors. So you could represent them. You don't need triangles. You could do cert like just dots and make them different colors. That's one way to differentiate your lines. 
Another way is to use different shapes. So let's say you didn't have colored pencils at your house. Well, don't worry, you can differentiate your lines, not by color, but instead by shape. And so let's look at the next data point. So let's say we look at the next mouth part, right? It goes six, seven, eight, and then 10. So I would then connect my dots. Again, mine are color coded. You would use straight lines and a ruler, okay? But this is the general idea. And so you can, again, you can color code them. You could just use dots um, and use different colors. You could use different shapes. So like those could be in black. They could all be in pen, black pen, as long as I use different shapes for the different data points. So you have to be able to differentiate your lines in some way. So on this graph, I'm only gonna put um, two of them, but know that when you're done, you should have five lines. Now, I have this. What is missing from my graph still, right? I have my terms for my title, so I'm not including the title because you're gonna write your title. But what else do you need to have in your graph to make your graph complete? And the answer is you need a figure legend. You need a key that tells somebody what do the different lines represent. So my triangles were my forcep mouth part. My um, pliers were the rectangle and so on and so forth. And so you need to make sure that you have a figure legend that basically tells somebody what are the different lines, which mouth part does that represent. And so you're gonna end up with five different lines on your graph. And this is going to allow you to see which mouth part was best adapted to their environment, right? That would be the one where the population increases whereas the one where the population decreases would be the least adapted. And that's what we're looking for. Now in our prey experiment, the graph is set up in very much the same way. We're comparing prey population size, right? So our prey population size and generation. So my axes are still the same. So I have, oops, I didn't change that. That should say not predator, that should say prey. Sorry about that, that should say prey population size. So my prey population size would be here, generations would be on the bottom, and then again, I need to look at my prey population sizes, and you'll notice that you had one that was in the 900s, so you have to make your scale accordingly, and so if I was doing this, I might make this scale 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, and then my generations would still be parent, second, third, fourth. When I do this, again, I have five different types of preys. I have my different bean colors. I have my green, my red, my white, my brown, and my black. So how many lines should you have on this graph? Well, you should have five lines, right? One line for each of the different bean colors. And again, just like the predator graph, you wanna make sure that you differentiate your two lines and also include a figure legend that tells somebody what the different lines represent. And so this is what you need to do for your graph. Include those terms on your title and then set up your graphs and make your graphs for your two parts. You, have, you need one for the predator population and you need one for the prey population. So that's what you're doing for your graphs. So what I put here is your quiz 12 study guide. So for natural selection, you want to define natural selection. You want to understand that a trait would be passed on and selected for if an individual with that trait has more offspring than other individuals. So when you think of natural selection, it's not simply just survival of the fittest. That's not exactly entirely correct because it's not only survival, but it's differential reproductive success. Organisms that have more offspring are going to pass those traits on with greater frequency than an organism that has less number of offspring. 
And so again, it's not just survival that matters. Yes, survival definitely does play a role, but it's not limited to only survival. It has to also include reproduction, right? And it has to be a trait that is heritable because if that trait can't be passed on, but it gave somebody an advantage, well, you're not gonna see that trait more likely in future generations because it's not heritable. So it also has to do with the trait being heritable. Understand that sexual reproduction provides genetic diversity, which can affect natural selection, right? Because when you have natural selection, you get unique combinations of genetic um, possibilities. And when you have genetic diversity, right, that can affect natural selection. In your marble experiment, if you're given pairs of marbles and told the pattern of inheritance of deleterious alleles, meaning told whether it was dominant deleterious or recessive deleterious, you should know and understand how many survivors would be less be left, right? So if it was a recessive deleterious allele, then only the white whites would be killed off. If you're talking about a dominant deleterious alleles, homozygous dominant and heterozygous would both die. So if I gave you, you know, a certain number of pairs of marbles, you should be able to tell me, if I told you it's pattern of inheritance, how many survivors would be left. How is it possible for a dominant deleterious allele to remain in a population after one generation? Again, I talked about this, that if that dominant deleterious allele um, is something that comes on later in life, well, then those people who have that dominant deleterious allele can reproduce and pass it on to future generations. So it is possible for a dominant deleterious allele to stay in a population after one generation, but in our experiment, we only saw it in one because we assumed that they died off um, right away. Is it likely for a deleterious allele to be removed from a population? And we said that no, it's not very likely right? Because in order for it to be removed completely, one, heterozygous individuals are going to keep passing on that trait and it's going to stay in the population. And then for the next part, for recessive deleterious alleles, what happens to the frequency of that allele in the population? Well, as those homozygous recessives die off, right, the frequency of that allele in the population gets low. And when the frequency gets low, it's less and less likely that two individuals who are heterozygous are going to come together and have a child which would remove that gene from the population. So it's not very likely that a deleterious recessive allele is going to be removed from a population. For the predator-prey experiment, you want to review what behavioral adaptations helped predators to get food. And so that was covered in the video, right? So territorial, um, aggression, etc. So you want to review what some behavioral adaptations were that helped predators to get food. Uh, what represented the prey in this experiment, right? The prey in our experiment were the different color beans. So those represented our prey. And our predators, we were looking at the effect of the mouth parts on their ability to get food. And then lastly, if given a graph, know which predator preys are best or worst adapted. Meaning, if you see the population size going up, that means that they're well adapted. If you see their population size decreasing, that means that they're not well adapted and their population size is decreasing. And at some point, that population could potentially become extinct, which you want to see, did we see that in our experiment? And then lastly, read lab 13 that covers anatomy and physiology. And so this concludes the summary for lab 12.